Our next speaker is Mark Jacobson, who's the director of the Atmosphere Energy Program at Stanford University. Uh, as you've already heard, Mark is well known for his work on grid integration of 100% wind, water, and solar energy systems. Um, and as I said, we, we endeavored to, to provide a diversity of viewpoints here, and, and uh, we'll continue in that spirit this afternoon. Uh, the title of his presentation is Roadmaps for Transitioning All 50 U.S. States and 139 Countries to Wind, Water, and Solar Power for All Purposes. Mark, welcome to Michigan. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I'd also like to thank Ted for giving a balanced uh, proposal of, what, you know, of his view. And the only thing I'd like to just maybe clarify ahead of time is that what I'm going to present are not predictions of what will happen, but a proposal of what can, and I think based on the work, should happen in order to try to solve the problems I want to talk about. And the other thing is it's not coming from an advocacy Point of view. What I'm showing is not an advocacy point of view. It's from cold science and based on what over many years, in fact decades now, of work that I and others have done to come to these conclusions. And people may disagree with the numbers, but they are based on numbers that we have come up with and based on our experience, think are the answer, the, you know, the best uh, that we can do. And so I hope you view it from that point. Of you. But so let's first, I want to talk first about what part of what our solution is and then uh, why we have issues with other technologies that, not, are, that are not included and then kind of complete it and say, how can we actually finish solving this problem? So, what are the problems from our point of view? Well, everybody here is thinking about it from a, maybe a climate point of view. I'm, I'm actually thinking about it from an air pollution point of view, a climate and an energy security point of view. And most people don't realize, but there are four to seven million people die every year from air pollution. That's from cardiovascular disease, respiratory illness, complications from asthma, and 20% of these are children under the age of five years old. This is one of the leading, avoidable, leading causes of death, but also avoidable causes of death. And based on statistical cost of life, it's, it's on the order, and this is over 100, these are over all countries of the world based on their GDPs and scaling the statistical cost of life over different countries, about 20 to $25 trillion per year in costs. Now, that's uh, in 2050 costs, but brought back to 2013 dollars. Global warming, even at over $500 a ton of cost, is still around 15 to $25 trillion per year. So it's comparable to health costs uh, based on most recent estimates and projections to 2050. Uh, and these are two major problems, and in increasing energy use, of course, re results in, if you're using fossil fuels, in shortages of fossil fuels at some point. We don't know exactly when, but at some point you're going to have supply uh, shortages that result in economic, political, and social instability. So we want to solve those problems before they arise, and these are three big problems we're trying to solve with the solutions I want to talk about. But just to give you an idea of what most of the world actually looks like, we can look out here. Today it doesn't look that dirty, but most of the world does look like this and this. And that's like smoking two to three packs of cigarettes per day. In the United States, there are, even today, there are about 60 to 65,000 people die per year prematurely from air pollution. And in California alone, it's about 12 to 13,000. These are the lungs of a teenage non-smoker who died in a car crash in Los Angeles in the 1970s. And it used to be smoking two packs of cigarettes a day just to live there. And even if you live in a big city today in the United States, your life is about six to nine months shorter than if you don't live in the big city. So these are, these are serious problems that we're trying to solve. Of course, global warming, um, if we look at the temperature change, this is just for January 2016, you can see that Compared with the 1951 to 1980 average, it's 1.1 1 .1 degree Kelvin above, above average. And most of that warming is in the Arctic region and even well, at high latitudes where you have snow and sea ice covered surfaces. And most of that's because you get this enhanced feedback due to the fact that when you melt snow on top of sea ice, well, snow is more reflective than sea ice. So if you melt the snow, you uncover darker sea ice that absorbs more sunlight, warming up even faster. If you melt the sea ice, that has, that's even that's brighter than the ocean below. 
So you melt the sea ice and you uncover dark ocean below and the ocean absorbs more sunlight and that melts the ocean even faster. So there's a positive feedback whenever you have snow and sea ice and that's why you get more warming uh, over these surfaces at high latitudes. But you know, we're trying to avoid, since 1870, we're trying to avoid 1.5 degrees Celsius. You know, I, the Paris Agreement, they focused on two, although most people really wanted, or a lot of people really wanted to focus on one and a half degrees which is most scientists, climate scientists, believe that one and a half degrees Celsius is what's necessary to shoot for. And so I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But this is really the, probably the critical graph of this whole talk. It really explains what is a net observed global warming, it's, which is on the right, which is, this is an old graph, so it only shows about 0.8 degrees warming. But that net observed warming is really the combination of greenhouse gas warming on the left, fossil fuel and biofuel soot warming, that's black and brown carbon from diesel exhaust, jet fuel, kerosene burning, uh, biomass burning, biofuel burning. That's dark particles that absorb sunlight a million times more powerfully per unit mass than, green, than carbon dioxide absorbs uh, and heats the atmosphere. But there's a lot less soot in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide, and the soot only lasts a few weeks, whereas carbon dioxide lasts on the order of 50 to 70 years, its e-folding lifetime. And Anyway, those two components of warming plus a little bit of urban heat island effect comprise the warming, and they're offset. Half of that warming is offset by cooling aerosol particles, which are sulfates and nitrates, organic material, ammonia, and associated water that are reflective but also enhance cloudiness. And they, so these cooling particles, which just like the warming particles, are air pollution particles. I mean, when you look at air pollution smog, all you see is particles. I mean, 90 to 95 percent of the visibility reduction in smog is particles. But those particles cause 90% of air pollution mortalities and morbidities. So you have to eliminate those air pollution particles. But a lot of those particles are actually masking a lot of global warming. So if you just cool, cleaned up all the particles alone, which you want to do for health purposes, you would actually uncover, you double the amount of global warming in the system. This is why global warming is such a, actually a, a, even a worse problem than most people think, because half of it is being hidden or masked in the system right now by air pollution. But so the really, you know, one strategy is just control the soot particles, the black carbon and brown carbon, because they're short-lived. If you stop their emissions, they come out of the atmosphere fast, and you can actually save, you know, potentially delay the loss of the Arctic ice, for example. But that's not satisfying because you still have all these greenhouse gases in the air that are causing most of the problem and going to just grow and grow over time. So really the only solution to address both climate and air pollution problems simultaneously is to eliminate the cooling and the warming particles together with the greenhouse gases. And the only way to do that, because almost all of these emissions of the particles and the gases come from energy. So, you know, the only exceptions are, well, there's some, you know, digestive tracts of keep sheep and cattle, for example, for, for some methane. And there's, there's land use change too, but that can be addressed as well. But we want to eliminate or change the energy infrastructure of the world. So how do we do that? We have to convert everything. Well, our idea, our proposal, is to electrify everything and provide that electricity with clean renewable energy for all purposes. So here's an example <coughs> excuse me, of what that electricity system would look like. So we'd have, well first, so, so transportation, well the electricity we'd provide with clean renewable energy, wind, onshore and offshore wind, solar PV on rooftops and in power plants, concentrated solar power, CSP, geothermal, hydroelectric, tidal and wave power. Transportation, we'd take that clean electricity and run it through batteries primarily for battery electric vehicles and some hydrogen fuel cell battery hybrids. And in the case of like some trains, you might have induction, uh, electric induction charging or wires for some buses and trains. But the fuel cell, you know, you can actually, there are some companies now that are building electric aircraft for short haul flights up to 200 kilometers and eventually up to 600 kilometers. And these will be pure electric commuter flights. But we can't, for long distance commuter flights, we're expecting that they're gonna to have to be, you're not gonna be able to electrify a long distance flight, at least in our lifetimes. That could be a hydrogen fuel cell electric, battery electric hybrid. And same thing with long distance ships and trains and even in trucks, those would be uh, fuel cell hybrids and in fact, there are companies that are doing that right now. 
But everything else would be, you'd want to electrify everything as much as possible, minimize the hydrogen, because hydrogen, even though it's clean, if you produce it from wind and water and solar, it's less, much less efficient than pure battery electric vehicle. For heating, cooling, we'd use heat pumps for air and water heater, heating, some solar hot water preheating. For in industry, we'd electrify that too, use electric arc furnaces, induction furnaces, dielectric heating, electric resistance heating. So basically, uh, we take everything and electrify as much as possible and use clean renewable energy to produce that, that electricity. And I'll show you what the benefit of the electrification is in a little bit. But you might ask, well, if we're gonna have all these uh, renewables, and a lot of them are intermittent, like wind and uh, solar PV is intermittent. In other words, the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. We need some kinds of storage. But the thing is, you're electrifying all sectors, so we can actually optimize this by combining, because we now have a lot more flexible loads. For example, you don't need to connect a wind turbine directly to an like automobile. You could have batteries in the car. Or you can also offset your heating use or cooling use uh, with storage for your electrical, because you know air conditioning is run uh, with electricity for the most part. And instead of using electricity at peak times of the day, because that's the reason you usually have afternoon peaks in the summertime, at least in California, that's why you have the, you, whenever you have out power outages, because the sol in the summertime you have too much electricity demand for air conditioning. Well, you can eliminate that problem, and I'll come back to this slide in a second. Just like uh, my university did this in 1998, they had a big, they have a big ice cube under a building. And what they do is they produce ice at night with, when the electricity price is low. And then during the day when they need electricity, they just run it, uh, water through the coils. Such This is not the specific ice cube, but they run water through the coils here and cool the water and send it to buildings. And they eliminate the afternoon electricity demand. So this is one way to use storage, uh, heating, cooling storage in ice. And that cost, by the way, to you're offsetting electricity use, that costs about $30 to $40 per kilowatt hour of storage compared to a battery, which is around $300 a kilowatt hour for the Tesla wall battery, for example. Uh, another example is water. So something else that Stanford did, we used to have a big natural gas plant, cogen plant, right outside my building. In fact, I had to look at it every day for many years. And it was bulldozed a year ago and replaced with these two boilers and a chiller. And you'll notice that on the right, that's, the, that's a year over the year. So the left is like January and the right is December. And the bright blue is the cooling demand, which peaks in the summer. The bright red is the heating demand, which peaks in the winter. But you'll notice that at any given day of the year, uh, there's both cooling and heating demand at the university at the same time. So if you actually, usually when you create cold, you release heat. And when you create heat, you release cold. Instead of wasting the released heat or cold, you actually capture it and then send it to these boilers and chillers and store it for, and then ship it around the university with pipes. You can actually recover, you know, around 50% or some number of that waste to heat. And that's what Stanford does. And so it replaced entirely 80% of the carbon emissions and energy generation for heat and electricity with these boilers and a chiller and an elaborate piping system plus uh, solar PV. And so that's another way you can offset energy use and avoid uh, peaks in demand is with storage. Now, what about rocks and soil? What is that? Well, this is another way. This is called seasonal heat storage. And so here's a community in Drake Landing, Okotoks, Canada. It's an hour south of Calgary. There are 52 homes here. And they were built about 12, 11 and 12 years ago, I think now. And uh, on the roofs of the garages, you can see in the top left, there are solar collectors on the roof. In the summer, uh, these solar collectors, they have a glycol solution. The sun heats up the solution, sends it to a building, heats up water, transfers the heat to water. The water gets piped underground. Uh, the ground under this, under this uh, park here has been excavated and rocks have been put in. The water heats the rocks down to 30 meters and the rocks, the heat is then is insulated and the heat is stored up to about 80 degrees Celsius through winter time. When there's snow on the ground, the water, the heat, from the rocks gets transferred back to water and then gets transferred to the buildings and provides 100% of the building heat energy when there's snow in the, on, on the roofs of the, and in the homes, on the roofs of the homes. And the whole overall system from collection to use is about 58% efficient. But this costs, you know how much this costs? Compared to a battery storage of $300 an hour, it costs $1 per kilowatt hour less than $1 per kilowatt hour for that. So this, these are all innovative existing technologies that we've never really had a need to use on a large scale till now. So 
you combine these types of heating, cooling, uh, storage with existing technology, CSP with storage, uh, with either molten nitrate salt or a phase change material, which is phase change material is about $20 a kilowatt hour, molten nitrate salt is about $30 a kilowatt hour. Um, so these are one-tenth the cost of batteries. Uh, pumped hydroelectric, existing hydroelectric is a big battery. And we'll need hydrogen, so that's a form of storage. And we can also use what's called demand response. Okay, so I'll talk about the storage, how it actually combines with this later. But these are the things we can do. Okay, so these are the things we can use and what we proposed that are, I'll show you how we propose them to use them to provide energy for the whole world. But why, so why don't we include nuclear in our, in our proposal? And it's not because it's really bad. I'm not saying it's bad. It's just, we're trying to, we did a study in 2009 looking at different energy technologies and nuclear came out somewhere in the middle. It wasn't the best technology that we thought to solve the problems. And we looked at it from an, mostly an environmental standpoint, but from like looking at ex, or the externality standpoint, not only environmental, but like climate, air pollution, land use, water supply, radioactive waste issues, uh, uh, energy security. But it, and it wasn't the worst at all. It wasn't, by far, it wasn't the worst. It just wasn't quite so good as these other options. So our premise is, if you have, you know, if you have a limited amount of funds, why not just go with the best options you can? And nuclear was somewhere in the middle. It wasn't one of the best options. Now, if the other ones don't work, sure, then we have nuclear. But okay, so from our point of view, what are the issues? Well, it's six to 24 times more CO2 and pollution per kilowatt hour than wind. And you might say, well, I don't believe that number <laughs> because IPCC says it's, you know, it's almost the same. Okay, I'm gonna show you exactly why in the next few slides. And I'll show you how this is exactly consistent with IPCC. In fact, it's more conservative. But anyway, I'll talk about that in a second. It takes, also takes 10 to 19 years between planning and operation and that's not just the construction time, that's the planning time. I'll give you more details about that in a second. Versus two to five years for wind or solar. It costs three to four times that of onshore wind. This is the unsubsidized cost of energy from Lazard, who does it, their own analysis. That's not even our numbers. And so if you combine that, it takes two to 10 times longer to obtain one third to one fourth the CO2 savings per dollar than wind or solar. And so this is a question, it's, so it's not, I'm not saying it's not useful for a lot of things, and that hasn't been put up in the past to, to a large scale. It's just if we're going forward and we want to spend a lot of money on something, why would we spend it on something that's giving you much less benefit at much higher cost? Okay, and then we look at the other issues, and this is from IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. In their summary, it's in their, in their summary, they say there's robust evidence and high agreement that increased use of nuclear power leads to weapons proliferation risk, meltdown risk, waste risk, and mining risk. So these are not, these are other peripherals that you don't have these issues with these other uh, technologies. And I'm not gonna get into all the details, but we know that one and a half percent of all nuclear reactors ever built to date have melted down to some degree. And at least five countries of the world have secretly developed weapons under the guise of either civilian nuclear energy programs or research reactor programs. So let's look at this, the CO2, and I don't want to spend too much time on this because I don't have limited time, but okay, just start with the life cycle. This is the normal you know, construction of the plant, the fueling, the energy going, and CO2 emissions associated with the uh, running of the plant and decommissioning at the end of the lifetime. So the IPCC gives a range of four to 115 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour of electricity generated from the life cycle. Our estimate from nuclear was nine to 70, which is well within that range. The nine, by the way, is the nuclear energy industry estimate. And the 70 was the median of a set of 110 studies that were compiled by two other authors that were published, published papers. So we weren't even at the high end of IPCC. So I think, and this, so the blue in this case is the low estimate, the red is our, is our high estimate. And you know, and then we have wind and we have all the others. Okay, and so you, it's not that much different from let's say geothermal or, or solar PV in particular. You can see it's a little higher than wind at CSP. But this is only one type of emission. Actually, this is not the major emission. The major emission is this time lag that I'll try to quantify here a little bit. The time lag between planning and operation of a nuclear plant. On average in the United States and 
for the most part worldwide. It's 10 to 19 years. And that's a site permit time of uh, 3.5 to six years, construction permit approval and issue time of 2.5 to four years, and construction time of four to nine years. So that adds up to 10 to 19 years. For hydroelectric, it's still eight to 16 years, but hydro can last uh, at least 80, sometimes 100, 110 years. Coal with CCS, well, doesn't really exist, but coal without CCS is about six to 11 years. Geothermal is about three to six years. Wind, on average, you can find extremes beyond these, by the way, like the offshore wind farm in, uh, off Cape uh, Nantucket. But you can also find shorter examples. For example, I was at a PV plant in, Arizona, in, in uh, Nevada. It took nine months between planning and actually operating this plant. So, but anyway, our range here is two to five years for most typical wind and solar installations. So that time lag results if, you, if you're using the regular electric power grid while you're waiting around for that technology to be put up, it results in if you compare what's taking any technology with the technology that takes the shortest time, and the technologies that are taking the shortest time are here wind and CSP in this case, solar PV, then you're talking an additional like 59 to 106 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour for nuclear. You, now there's one more CO2 loss, and that's from covering land with, uh, with a technology, because by covering that land, you prevent carbon sequestration uh, in vegetation that's usually buried underground, but this is not very large. These are only like one to two. And anyway, so that's, it's not gonna add much to, for any of these technologies, but I'll just, but if you add these all together, you start to, you get the separation here. And so nuclear, in this case, you get to 68 to 180 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, which is 6.3 to 24 times that of wind. And so this is not necessarily on its own a reason to say, oh, we should use, not use nuclear, because clearly it's better than coal even with carbon capture. Uh, but it's just one thing that a lot of people focus on, so that's why people always, when I want to criticize our work, they point to that and say, well, IPCC says this. And, I say, and so I'm actually showing you what IPCC actually does show. And it shows that when we're comparing apples to apples, our numbers are actually more conservative than IPCC's range. But they're not including this opportunity cost emissions, which are real emissions that you can't deny that exist. <clears throat> now, why is it impossible for nuclear to solve a global warming problem? So let's look at, this is what, another thing is the time scale so I almost have to read this. Okay, so if we're trying to avoid one and a half degrees warming, we can only allow 350 to 575 gigatons of carbon dioxide after 2015 to enter into the atmosphere. There's a relationship that, there's been thought to be a linear relationship between the total accumulated CO2 emitted into the atmosphere and uh, temperature, global net temperature change since 1870. So this is the limit, 350 to 575. And if you want to stay below two degrees Celsius, the limit's 1150 to 1450 gigatons of CO2. Well, under our plans that I'm proposing here, eliminating 80% of world emissions by 2030 and 100% by 2050, that will still emit about 415 gigatons of CO2. But that's in the range of solving the problem, at least get it, keeping temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius. But that, if you just do it linearly, 80% by 2030, that really requires about 5.3% emission reductions each year for the next 15 years to get 80% reduction. But as I mentioned, a new nuclear plant proposed today requires 10 to 19 years until it operates. Wind and solar requires two to five years. So it is impossible, I'm gonna pause it, it is impossible for nuclear to be used on any large scale to avoid a 1.5 degree warming. It is. Possible, not necessarily saying it's going to happen, but at least it is possible with a wind, water, solar system. And a lot of what I say, we're looking at whether it's technically or economically possible. We're not saying it's going to happen. We're not predicting it's going to happen. And it, that depends on you and the rest of society if we actually want to get our act together and do something. I'm just saying this is, this is a possibility. And it is possible for wind, water, solar to solve the problem. It is not possible. I will claim is absolutely impossible for nuclear to be used to solve this problem. 
And you might say, well, it can be used in part. I can, you can do that. But as I said, every dollar you spend on it is one less dollar you're gonna spend on something that's solving the problem even more. Well, why not gas? Some people say, why not, uh, why not use, or why we should use more natural gas? Well, it's 50 to 70 times more CO2 and air pollution per kilowatt hour than wind, onshore wind, that is. And gas mining, transport, and use in the United States alone causes 5,000 out of those 65,000 premature deaths per year. There are 2.5 million abandoned and 1.7 million active oil and gas wells in the United States, and we need another 20,000 every year. And they're devastating the land. Just 2.5 million take up an area, of, include the well pads, the roads, the storage facilities. They take up an area the size of Maine. So we're taking up basically almost two states of Maine just for oil and gas operations, just for the mines in the United States. And this picture on the left shows what the Great Plains is turning into, a big industrial park of natural gas. And when we talk about how much wind and solar, the numbers are small in comparison to this, to power the whole world, I mean, in terms of numbers of devices you need. And this is just for the, this is just in the US, this is just in the United States. And why not what we call clean coal or coal with carbon capture? It's another of these, all of the above technologies. Well, aside from the fact that it hardly exists at any commercial scale in the United States, it's 50 times more CO2 per kilowatt hour than wind, and 150 times more air pollution emissions per kilowatt hour than wind. Because you don't reduce any of the mining or transport CO2 emissions. You just you put basically try to capture CO2 as it's coming out of the pipe or the stack, but you still need to mine and transport the, CO, the, car, the coal, which is on the order of a third of the emissions, and you need 25% more coal, so you increase that, in fact. And you don't reduce any of the other pollutants coming out of, out of the coal-fired power plants. You can add additional scrubber, scrubbing uh, devices to take out other pollutants, but with the carbon capture alone, you don't, so that's why you increase air pollutions. So it's really not clean coal, it's still dirty coal. In fact, it's dirtier in terms of air pollution than regular coal. It's just less CO2, but still a lot more of CO2. And what about how much you know, footprints, and I should differentiate between, the, for land areas, the difference between a footprint and spacing. So people say, well, wind takes up a huge area. Well, there's a big, uh, there's an area associated with having to separate wind turbines because you don't want the one turbine to interfere with the other turbine in terms of the wind, extracting energy from the wind. But the actual footprint on the ground is pretty trivial. It's just basically that pole in the ground and some cement around it. So you can kind of see from these photographs. And so when we look at the, where is the footprint? So the footprint, just to differentiate it one more time, is the footprint is just you know, this small area on the ground that the turbine, the turbine occupies, whereas the spacing is the space in between that you can use for multiple purposes, like farming or ranching or open space, or it could be over the ocean. Now, I want to just give an example of different energy technologies doing the same thing in this case, powering 100% of US on-road vehicles. Now, if we did that with cellulosic ethanol to power the whole vehicle fleet, well, there's a big range of uncertainty between five and 35%. This is just an average between those two numbers. But that's on the order of 20% of the entire United States, including Alaska. The corn ethanol, there's a little less uncertainty, but it's still on the order, uh, it's still on the order of about 14% of the US. Now, for nuclear, it's not that big of a, area, it's about the size of Rhode Island, so to power the whole US vehicle fleet. So that's not one of its bigger issues in terms of taking up huge amounts of area. Now wind, it's taking up more space area, but it's less footprint on the ground. The footprint is only less than three square kilometers. To power, that's for, that's for uh, on the order of 72,000 to 144,000 five megawatt wind turbines in wind speeds between seven and 8.5 meters per second three square kilometers of land on the ground, but you need spacing, so that's about half a percent of the US in terms of the space between the turbines. So it's, to do the exact same thing as corn ethanol, you need 1 30th the land area for footprint and a mil 1 millionth the land area for spacing. Or it could, a lot of it could go offshore, in which case it doesn't need um, either foot, footprint on land. Now geothermal and solar are taking well, solar's taking like one third the spacing area, but more footprint, and same thing with ge geothermal. Geothermal takes less spacing area, but still more footprint than wind. But geothermal, solar, and wind, they're not taking up large areas. And I'll show you soon how much area is needed to power the whole world, basically, for all purposes. 
uh, in a minute. So let's look at, can we power the entire world for all purposes with wind and water and solar power? So this is the end use power demand for all purposes. So that excludes transmission distribution losses, or let's say it's before trans, well, it's after transmission distribution law. It's actually what people use, but including energy self-use in like, you know, oil, coal, and gas mining and drilling, the energy used there. It's worldwide, well, this is over 139 countries, which represents over 99% of the emissions worldwide. 12.1 terawatts is the 2012 end use power demand. If we go forward to 2050, it's about 20.6 terawatts. But if we electrify everything and power that electricity with clean renewable energy or any type of electricity for that matter, you go down to 11.8 terawatts. You go down 42.5% power demand. Of that, 23.2 percentage points is because of the efficiency of electricity over combustion. And most of this you can see in transportation. When you drive an electric car, about 80 to 86% of the electricity going into the car goes to move the car, and the rest is waste heat. A gasoline car, only 17 to 20% of the energy in the car goes to move the car, and the rest is waste heat. So you reduce energy use when driving an electric car by a factor of four to five. That's where you get most of this electrification improvement. The other, the other sectors, you're not getting nearly so much. Then there's 12.8% reduction in energy from the literally from the mining, transporting, and refining of fossil fuels. That takes 12.8% of the total end use energy supply is, is literally mining and refining and transporting fossil fuels. And that, by the way, also uranium and biofuels too. So, and then the 6.5% is additional end use energy efficiency improvements beyond the business as usual case, because that 20.6 terawatts of business as usual in 2050 accounts for some energy efficiency improvements already. So the 6.5% is just additional that we can try to squeeze out. But the goal is to try then for 2050 to obtain 11.8 terawatts of end use power. And so we propose to do it with wind and water and solar power. And so and these are, this is every, after everything has been electrified, this is the, these are the number of devices over these 139 countries we would need. And you could see we need a total if, if onshore wind power is 23.5% of total end use power, that's about 1.6 million five megawatt wind turbines for the whole world. And about 935,000 offshore wind turbines, that's 13.6%. 16% would be residential rooftop PV, 12.2% commercial government rooftop PV, about 20% solar PV power plants, 9.7% CSP power plants, less than 1% geothermal, 4% hydro, which is all existing. You'll notice the numbers on the right are the new numbers we would need beyond what's existing. We are not proposing any new hydroelectric plants, just increasing the capacity factor slightly of existing plants and tiny amount of tidal wave power. So I should point out here that some of this energy is centralized and some is distributed. So it's a combination. It's more distributed than what we have today, but it's not like we're distributing everything. So, I mean, there's the CSP plants, the solar PV plants, which make up close to 30%, the hydro plants, those are, and the geothermal, those are basically similar to what we have today in terms of centralization. Wind and rooftop PV is decentralized. So it's a combination. You can't do it all with just rooftop PV, and you can't do it all with, um, you know, wind. This, you need a mix in order especially to balance supply with demand. So this is the land area you'd need to power the entire world for all purposes with these technologies, essentially the 139 countries. And the reason we don't have the rest of the countries is just we didn't have the raw energy. The IEA doesn't have the raw energy data broken down by those countries, but they do represent less than 1%. Now, the total land area for onshore wind, the footprint area is very small. The spacing area is on the order of 0.93% of land area of the world. For the rooftop, doesn't take up new land, so that wouldn't be counted as new land. Utility, PV, and CSP, they take up 0.21%. So we're talking, that's essentially the new land is for footprint is 0.21%, or one-fifth of 1% 1 of the world's land. And for spacing, another close to 1%, 0.93%. So we're talking about 1.2% of 
land of the world. You know, and about 20% of the land is used for agriculture. So this is not, this is to power everything and does not account for eliminating all the footprint of natural gas, no more oil wells, coal mines, refineries, you name it, no gas stations. That's, so there's a lot of land that this would be offsetting, not in the same places necessarily. Okay, so let's then look at how do you, how do you make this system smooth to match supply with demand? So here's a few precepts, and then we did a study for the US to see if it's possible to match power supply with demand with our US numbers. And really the idea is we first electrify all sectors to create more flexible loads, and such as battery electric vehicles, that store electricity rather than required immediately. Now today, when we have too much wind and solar, it's usually wasted or shed, but we propose instead to use it to produce hydrogen, to heat or cool water, or to heat rocks, and then we'd use the stored heat and cold and hydrogen when needed instead of requiring electricity at that time or requiring heat at that time. Uh, we would store remaining wind and solar when we have too much of it in pumped hydro storage and CSP storage. And we'd use those and hydroelectricity to fill in gaps of supply. And we'd also use demand response to reduce sizes of peak demands. Okay, so then we did, we did a study for the 48 contiguous US states with our, because we had done 50 state plans. And in this study, we took all our estimates of wind and solar we needed for each of the 48 contiguous states and put it in a weather prediction model to predict the weather over six years and the resulting wind energy and also solar output every 30 seconds for six years over the US. Then we combine that, and this is for 2050, we combine that with a load estimate, projected load estimates for 2050, and combine that with the different storage options that I mentioned, not including stationary battery storage, but all the other ones I mentioned for heat and cold and hydrogen. So these are the results over the whole US for that six year period. And this just shows the monthly average results. And I'll get granular in the next slide. But it shows that each month, when we match, the red is energy supply, which is the wind and solar, et cetera. And the blue is the demand plus changes in storage plus losses. And we were able to match exactly every, every month for six years. Same thing here are four particular days, two sets of four days, where we were able to match the supply with demand. And in fact, we were able to do this every 30 seconds for six years with no loss of load at any time. And there were multiple solutions to this. It wasn't just one set of generators. And the costs, okay, so let me first look at the cost of energy. First, these are the, the energy cost, but the whole overall cost of the system is the energy cost plus the storage cost, plus the transmission cost, plus operations and maintenance cost. So here's just the unsubsidized cost of energy. And these are mostly from Lazard 2015, although I have an update from C with CSP from Solar Reserve. Uh, onshore wind, 3.2 to 7.7, .7, but Lawrence Berkeley Lab, their estimate of the mean, this is unsubsidized, is 3.6 cents a kilowatt hour. Hydroelectric is four to six. Utility scale PV is five to seven. These are the three cheapest forms of electricity in the US unsubsidized before subsidies are accounted for. Gas from combined cycles, 5.2 to 7.8. Advanced pulverized coal, 6.5 to 15. Geothermal, 8.2 to 11.7. Community PV, 7.8 to 13.6. CSP with 14 hour storage, about nine to 13 and a half. Nuclear from Lazard, 9.7 to 13.6, with a mean of 12.3. So we're talking, this is where you get three to four times more than onshore wind for present-day nuclear in the United States. Offshore wind is more expensive. Gas for peaking is also more expensive. And residential rooftop is more expensive. You notice a residential rooftop versus community PV versus utility PV are the exact same PV panel, so why is it so much cheaper for utility? Well, it's all economies of scale and labor. I mean, you can, when you buy panels in bulk, they're cheaper, and the labor is cheaper when you have one job where it's done routinely rather than different jobs for different houses. But this is the mean for that study we did for the US. The mean cost of all the electric power generators, in our case, uh, the, well, sorry, the mean cost of electricity accounting for everything was 10.6 cents a kilowatt hour, including the storage, transmission distribution, O&M. And 
compared to conventional generation in 2050 brought back to 2013 dollars, the conventional electricity direct cost was the same, 10.6 cents a kilowatt hour. So there was no change in the direct cost of total energy because even though the wind, water, solar had lower, lower cost of the generators, it had high, more storage and transmission distribution costs. But you have to account for the health and climate costs of the conventional generation, which is 17 cents a kilowatt hour. So it's, we're talking, we reduced total social costs 60%. Now, if we look at all sectors, not just the electricity sector, because we're electrifying all sectors, and we, you can't compare that with today because you have to compare with the cost of gasoline and you have to compare the, you know, the cost of energy for the other sectors. But our total overall all sector energy cost for wind, water, solar is 11.4 cents a kilowatt hour. And you can see the breakdown of the different components of that. That's, that's reasonably within range of what we'd hope to get at for a completely renewable energy system in 2050. Okay, so what about the transition timeline? We need 80% conversion by 2030 and 100% by 2050. So this is one way to do it. It's a, you know, if we don't do anything, we go to that 2050 BAU number, 20.6 terawatts. If we electrify everything, we go down to the 100% line and those three different grays are due to the different efficiencies I talked about, and we want to then power that 100% with wind, water, and solar. We, so we ramp out the um, fossil fuels over time. This all, I guess I'll have a matter of time, so I should skip to a conclusion. Okay, well, this just shows if we do do this transition, 80%, well, the green, this is a comparison of model simulation with data for CO2 levels in the atmosphere since 1750, at least 1750 to 2015, we can match the data almost exactly. Then the, f the rest of the numbers are projections. The green line is if we eliminate 100% of emissions today, that gives you CO2 levels less than 350, but that's not gonna happen. The blue line is 80% by 2030 and 100% by 2050. That gives us to 350 parts per million by 2100. The black line is 80% by 2050 and 100% by 2100. That also gets us down. The rest are IPCC scenarios that get us up to 450 to 800. So let me just summarize by saying the following. If we do this conversion to 100% clean renewable energy, we can reduce power demand by on the order of 42.5%, eliminate millions of air pollution deaths, eliminate climate costs and impacts. Each person would say, because you, even though the cost of energy is similar, you need less energy. So the cost that each person has to pay is less, about $90 per year in fuel costs, but the health and climate benefits are around $4,600 internalized per year per person. The, st the cost of energy is 11 to 12 cents a kilowatt hour. We create 17 million more jobs worldwide than we lose and 2 million in the US. We'd require only 0.2% of the land for footprint and 092 for spacing. We'd make countries energy independent, reduce international conflict, which would reduce international conflict, create distributed power, more distributed power, which reduces terrorism and catastrophic risk problems, but we still would have, we'd still have a lot of centralized power as well. We'd reduce energy poverty by up to 4 billion people worldwide. But there are barriers, including upfront costs, transmission needs, lobbying, and politics, but materials are not limits. So thank you very much. If anyone has them. Hello, Dr. Jacobson. It's Timothy Maloney. I've calculated the cost of the wind and solar portion of the build-out called for in Table 2 on page 8 of your 2015 paper in Energy and Environmental Sciences that um, using the NREL photovoltaic cost for 2015 and the Department of Energy onshore wind cost for 2014 modified by the IRENA improvement in, uh, in cost structure. That comes to $21 trillion for the wind and solar portion of the build-out. Whereas in table S14 on pages 92 and 93 of your 2015 paper, you present eight scholarly studies averaging the cost of current and future advanced uh, pressurized water reactors that average $6.20 per peak watt. 
at that price, the 1,591 gigawatts average that you call for in year 2050 would come in at only $9 trillion. Would you comment on that price difference between the $21 trillion versus the $9 trillion for APWR? Well, our costs for that system are not $21 trillion, but $15 trillion, so you're not too far off there. So that includes storage. That's for the whole system, our cost for the whole system. And by the way, our costs are for 2050, not 2015, but 2050 brought back to 2013 dollars. And it's for 2050, and it's for not only the wind and solar, but geothermal, the tidal wave, CSP plus storage. So there's a discrepancy there. And you can see in, the, in our paper, the subsequent paper that we did on the grid integration study, which has these numbers, you can see the cost calculation for that. So I think you'd want to update yourself with these numbers instead. With regard, I haven't done the costs with nuclear, but that, you know, so I can't comment on those. But the, the what other point were you making? The, well, regarding money as a stand-in for steel, concrete, and carbon dioxide equivalent, there's a, a less than half expenditure on the APWR approach. Well, uh, well, the expenditure, first of all, the thing is you can't, as we pointed out, you can't even get it started for 10 to 19 years. So there's a time lag in terms of solving the problem of where you're not addressing that problem. So one thing is the cost of something that's actually you're looking at cost of something that's that's going to be turned on tomorrow, versus uh, something that you know in reality it would take 10 to 19 years before you even can turn it on. So we have to look at the time sequence, in addition to the direct cost of energy, and plus you have to look at all the other things. It's not just the cost of energy. We chose these technologies based on not only their cost of energy, but their carbon emission equivalent emissions, plus their risks. Plus, uh, you know, land, land constraints in some cases, plus water constraints. So there was a whole, you know, you can focus on one parameter such as the cost, but that's not the only thing that goes into it. Take one more question over here. Uh, thanks. Uh, you, your plan calls for 21,500 CSP plants, and there's like maybe two dozen or, the, or so of those worldwide now that are of the 100 megawatt that you're calling for. So I'm wondering in like two to three decades, how is that any more realistic than? building hundreds of nuclear power plants, that's like a huge, you know, increase as well. And then my second question is, as far as mining, <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, everything we'd have to, as I pointed out, there are, we put in 20,000 gas wells every year. And during World War II, the United States built 330 airplanes in four years, and the world produced 730,000 aircraft. Uh, these not, you know, these numbers are, and every year the world produces about 60 to 70 million automobiles. So, you know, it really, do, it's all, as I said, this is not a projection of what will happen. This is a, a proposal of what can happen and what we think, we think is necessary to solve the problem. So it really is up to policymakers to say, do you want to, or in the public, you guys, to see, do we want to do this? If you want to do it, it can be done. It's not a question of, well, yeah, if you don't have any policies to, to push it forward, it certainly is not going to happen for sure. Great. Thank you very much.